um, privileged to be involved in coronary intervention for um, since its beginnings in the uh, late 1970s when I went to Switzerland to uh, study with Dr. Andreas Grunzik, who's the founder, and I'll show you some of that. <clears throat> since that time, beyond the simple balloon, we have a whole vast armamentarium of tools, and the question is, uh, how do we use them and when do we use them? And I'm reminded of um, the uh, first defibrillation that occurred at Brigham uh, in association with Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, where I had the privilege of doing my cardiac fellowship. And at the, just before that, uh, there was a cardiac surgeon who, beca who began uh, mitral valve surgery, Dr. Dwight Harkin. And Dr. Harkin was not only a brilliant surgeon and innovator, he was also a wonderful showman. <clears throat> he also let it, known to, let it be known to the newspapers in Boston that he had a machine that would bring dead people back to life. Well, of course, this was one of the first uh, defibrillators. And one day he was operating, and he got a call from the uh, Boston Police Department that there was a dead man in one of the uh, streets in, in Boston. And he sent his resident out, and he went out with him in his green Buick. And there was a huge crowd around this uh, person lying in the street. And uh, in those days, the defibrillators were very large instruments. Uh, he bent over the patient, the resident bent over the patient. They brought the uh, defibrillator there. And the uh, resident turned to uh, Dr. Harkin and he said, Dr. Harkin, uh, this man is not dead, he's drunk. Um, Dr. Harkin said, shut up and buzz him anyway, shock him anyway. And of course, the patient came back to life. Uh, but uh, and this just showed the power of this uh, intervention, but the question is who, who should we really apply it to? So I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, uh, how coronary intervention has evolved since uh, the procedure began in the uh, 1970s. This is uh, Dr. Andreas Grunzik, the founder of coronary angioplasty, who is a bold and brilliant innovator and was just the type of person to... Um, um, initiate this technique. And here he is using biplane system, which he emphasized to, in order to visualize the coronaries and multiple views. Do you have a pointer? And uh, you can see to the uh, right, uh, this is uh, the first patient who underwent uh, balloon uh, angioplasty. There's a high-grade lesion in the left anterior descending coronary artery. And after the balloon, the result looks uh, uh, quite, quite good. So these are the types of results he was getting, the first case being done in September of uh, 1977. And this is the equipment that, that was used at that time. And um, you can see the balloon catheter. There's no independently movable guide wire. This is a small little uh, guide wire, which was very stiff. And interestingly enough, there was a lumen uh, right over here on this uh, balloon catheter through which you could measure pressure. And Dr. Grunzik always said it's not so much the angiographic appearance that's important, it's really the hemodynamics to judge how well you uh, uh, have dealt with that coronary stenosis. Well, let's go to 2011, and I just want to make the point that angiography is luminography. It tells you about the hole in the coronary artery, not the donut, what the uh, vessel wall is made of. And we need some better uh, idea of who to perform procedures in. And this is where coronary hemodynamic measurement comes in, fractional flow reserve. We also can look at the vessel wall with um, uh, IVIS, which is far field, and optical coherence tomography, which is near field. And the question is, when do we use these tools to help guide therapy? Certainly not in the acute STEMI patient. That's not who we're talking about. And I agree, I agree completely with Dr. Maida. When you're dealing with six STEMI patients, keep it simple. There's no role for these uh, adjunctive uh, therapies. Now, the first point I want to emphasize is that of uh, fractional flow reserve. If you measure the pressure proximal to a stenosis and distal to a stenosis, if that stenosis is not severe, the ratio of the distal pressure to the proximal pressure should be 1.0. Now, further, if you increase coronary flow to bring out any hemodynamic problem, uh, 
the ratio of the distal pressure to the proximal pressure gives us a very, very important number. And here you see the role of fractional flow reserve for decision making in the cardiac catheterization laboratory. First, if the ratio of the distal to the proximal pressure is 0 0.75 or less, this has 100% specific, specificity with non-invasive testing. So a value of 0 0.75 is of tremendous physiologic and clinical significance, as I'll show you. Beyond that, once you place a stent, you should have a value of at least 0 0.9 to 0 0.95, and we really like to have values of 1.0, which is the uh, normal value. Here's an example of a patient with uh, uh, chest discomfort, multivessel coronary artery disease, equivocal results of stress testing, and here we have a lesion in the middle left anterior descending coronary artery, and we could look at this till the cow co cows come home. This is a very, very difficult lesion to decide whether it's causing myocardial ischemia to this patient. Well, how do we really uh, 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 calculate percent stenosis in the coronary artery? The vast majority of patients don't have quantitative coronary angiography done. We really take a, an estimate. So this is an intermediate lesion, which we usually think of lesions that we approximate between 40 and 70 percent. Is this an important lesion in this particular patient? Well, we simply slip a little guide wire with a pressure transducer on it. We have the guiding catheter to measure the pressure proximally, and we have the uh, 14,000 wire with the pressure transducer to measure the pressure distally. Then we infuse, infuse intracoronary adenosine. And you can see that this lesion, which looks uh, intermediate at the most, has a very abnormal value. The proximal pressure is here, uh, 115. The distal pressure, the mean pressure, is 89 millimeters of mercury. So this is a very abnormal fractional flow reserve of 0 0.77, near the point where you would do something about it. On the other hand, this lesion, which looks worse angiographically in this large circumflex coronary artery, has a fractional flow reserve of 0 0.92. So despite the appearance of this lesion, we know that it's not hemodynamically significant. So in summary, uh, fractional flow reserve is a lesion-specific index. It's independent of the heart rate or blood pressure. It has a normal value of 1.0. It takes into account collateral flow. There's no need to compare it to a normal coronary artery. It's an easy, reproducible measurement with profound clinical implications. Let's see what those implications are. If you look at patients <clears throat> in whom the interventionalist wants to perform stenting. His goal based on angiography is to perform a stent. And then you measure the fractional flow reserve. This is unstable patients. And if the fractional flow reserve is greater than 0 0.75, the patients can be randomized to a strategy of deferral of intervention. You don't put a stent versus actually performing the intervention. And you can see here that if your fractional flow reserve indicates that the lesion is not hemodynamically significant, the patients in whom you defer intervention, as opposed to the patients who, who you perform a stent, have a higher rate of cardiac death and MI. In other words, we're overstenting in this group of patients. By reference, these are patients with a fractional flow reserve of less than 0 0.75, and they do the worst. And here you see the five-year follow-up of these patients. And what it's telling you, if you have an intermediate lesion, you don't know if it's causing uh, this patient's problem, uh, we routinely measure the fractional flow reserve in our laboratory. If it's greater than 0 0.75 based on this data, we will not perform a PCI, and we reserve it for patients whose uh, fractional flow reserve is less than 0 0.75. So uh, deferring the uh, strategy of deferral is very important, and part of being an excellent interventional cardiologist is to know when not, when not to put that stent in. Furthermore, as we're dealing with more complex coronary disease, multivessel, left main, which I'll show you, uh, this is a very important study recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was patients with at least 50% lesions in two or, th or three major coronary arteries, and they were randomly allocated to angiographically guided PCI. That is, in your eye, you thought the patient should have a stent, versus placing an FFR uh, wire and using the FFR values to guide your PCI. And then one year follow-up was performed in all of these patients. And here's the result. If you used 
fractional flow reserve guidance for your PCI of intermediate lesions, these patients had a much better outcome at one year than if you merely used angiographically guided PCI. And if you look at the absolute percentage reduction, it was over 5%. That seems like a small value, but if you calculate the number needed to treat, it's less than 20 patients to show a significant difference. So it's not relative reduction, it's absolute uh, reduction, which is a much more important value, which was emphasized by one of the previous speakers. So when we're doing multivessel PCI and complex PCI, you often have lesions that are intermediate, and it, I think it, this is a very important point, whether you stent that particular lesion should be guided by fractional flow reserve rather than just a guess, an educated guess by angiography. Furthermore, if you look at the resource utilization for the fractional flow reserve group versus the angiographically guided group, the procedure, there was no difference in how long the procedure took. There was a lot less contrast used in the fractional flow reserve group as compared to the angiography group, and you can see that on average one less stent was used in the FFR group than the angiography group, and most important, these patients had a better outcome. So we need this hemodynamic adjunct in these uh, patients. Now what about FFR versus IVUS? Well, some people have proposed uh, putting in IVUS catheters uh, in patients with uh, intermediate lesion, and here you see the uh, minimum cross-sectional area of the lumen by IVUS, and you'll notice that when the lumen area goes below four square millimeters, that the event rate rises dramatically. Uh, here, for example, if you have a lumen area greater than uh, five square millimeters, your event rate is uh, four percent, whereas if you have a uh, lumen area less than four square millimeters, your event rate is 25 to uh, 30 percent. So some people have proposed using uh, IVUS uh, as a uh, surrogate to decide whether to treat uh, these patients. And here's the problem with that. If you look at the uh, fractional flow reserve over here and you look at the um, IVUS lumen area over here, here's four square millimeters. Well, above four square millimeters, for large vessel, there's a fairly good correlation between IVUS and lumen area, uh, between IVUS lumen area and fractional flow reserve. On the other hand, for vessels that are smaller, the lumen area is smaller than four square millimeters, this, this relationship totally breaks down. Here, for example, somebody with a two square millimeter area with a, a very abnormal fractional flow reserve and for the same area, you can see a very normal fractional flow reserve. Why is that? If you have a small coronary vessel to deal with, it may not be hemodynamically significant if you have a small lumen area by IVUS, and you really need the fractional flow reserve to help, help you make that decision. So what is IVUS good for? One is uh, to assess the adequacy of stent deployment. And here you see incomplete apposition, uh, which you can clearly see on the IVUS uh, image. Uh, you can see incomplete stent expansion over here, and finally a little edge tear clearly seen on the IVUS. None of these are easily visible on angiography, and you can't tell. So for optimal stent deployment, IVUS is certainly a useful tool. What about amb ambiguous findings on the coronary angiogram? Here's an example of a 59-year-old man with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and comes in with a non-ST elevation MI. He has a 99% lesion in the proximal right coronary, which is dominant, and we performed successful PCI, but there is an ambiguous osteo left main coronary artery lesion. Now, the left main coronary obviously supplies the most myocardium, is the most important clinically, and it's the area where uh, there's tremendous inter-observer variability and disagreement among experienced angiographers. So here we have fixed the right, and here is the left main coronary artery. And look at that osteum. Is that a peculiar bend in the left main, or is that lesion of clinical importance? We've already fixed the right coronary artery. Should we go ahead and put a stent here? Or some people would even send such a patient to coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Well, here we wanted to be absolutely sure, so we performed both fractional flow reserve and IVUS. The fractional flow reserve was 0 0.95. The IVUS lumen area was 13, 13 square millimeters, a very reassuring number. So this patient could be discharged at home. And here you see the sensitivity and specificity for the left main coronary artery. These are ROC curves. 
uh, fractional flow reserve is used as the gold standard, and you see the greatest sensitivity and specificity is for a luminary of about six square millimeters. If you have a luminaria in the left main coronary artery of six square millimeters or more, that patient can be uh, safely deferred, and that correlates with a very normal fractional flow reserve. And as we get into trials of left main intervention, which I'll show you, uh, we, we want to make sure that we're not including patients in those studies who don't need the procedure at all. So these adjunctive therapies are proving very useful in guiding our multivessel coronary artery intervention. What about if you have an ambiguous finding? What's that filling defect in the coronary artery? 69-year-old woman, risk factors, has had prior stents, and presents with unstable angina, with uh, exertional angina and dyspnea, which is increasing in frequency and severity. And here's her coronary angiogram, and you see this filling defect, which uh, could be a thrombus. Uh, and people said, well, let's put, a, uh, let's put one of those aspiration catheters in this patient and aspirate the thrombus. Well, I wanted to get a little bit more information because I wasn't sure. Uh, I thought this easily could be calcification. So we put an IVUS catheter and this is what we found, a dense ring, a dense arc of calcium. There was no thrombus present at all. As a result of that, because of the dense calcification, we performed rotational atherectomy, first of the circumflex, then the LAD and kissing stents from the left main into both vessels, and an excellent angiographic result with that. We never would have been able to pass uh, uh, an aspiration catheter, and of course it would not have retrieved anything because it's sometimes very difficult to tell a filling defect, whether it's calcification or, uh, or thrombus. So in summary, uh, which should you use, fractional flow reserve or IVUS? If you're trying to decide whether to stent an intermediate lesion, use fractional flow reserve. If there's an unusual appearance to something, use intravascular ultrasound. If you want to optimize stent placement by precisely measuring vessel dimensions, assessing stent apposition and expansion, and ruling out edge tears, this is another use for uh, intravascular ultrasound. More recently, uh, optical coherence tomography has been um, developed and is now available. Um, and this is, uh, uh, when you compare it to IVUS, Optical coherence tomography as an energy source uses near infrared light as compared to ultrasound. The most important thing is the axial resolution difference. IVUS has a resolution of about 200 micron, whereas, it, whereas optical coherence tomography has a much greater resolution of 10 micron, and the pullbacks are also much faster. IVUS pullback 0.5 to 1 millimeter per second. This is 10 to 20 millimeters per second. So this, these coronaries can be visualized extremely carefully. Because of this difference in resolution between these two systems, optical coherence tomography is good for the uh, very near field, whereas IVUS is used for the far field. This, this gives you much more thickness of the vessel penetration. Whereas, so the tissue penetration is much greater for uh, IVUS, but if you want to see the, su the surface, the uh, luminal surface, uh, this is a, a much better uh, technology. And this is uh, just showing you the beauty of these images. You can really look at the uh, vessel sizing. Here's a distal reference vessel, luminar uh, luminaria, proximal reference vessel, and you can also look at uh, lesion length. So you can really use this to assess uh, what size stents uh, to choose. Here is uh, uh, an example of uh, optical coherence tomography showing you a minimum stent area with a lot of uh, eccentricity of expansion, the maximum stent area. Here you see a side branch coming off the left main. So it also helps you guide uh, stent deployment and also it's uh, superior to uh, IVUS in terms of resolution. Here's an example that you can't really see on IVUS, a uh, near field, a lack of stent opposition. Here's an example of uh, protrusion of material through a stent, which is totally missed on IVUS. Again, this is the near field near the luminal surface. Here you see thrombi coming out of a stent uh, on OCT. Again, you miss it entirely on uh, IVUS examination. And here you see a tear, 
at the distal edge of a stent, again, totally missed by IVUS. So for near field examination, optical coherence tomography is going to play an important role. Yesterday, I showed you a little bit about our uh, work for prevention of AMI. It's excellent at looking at cap thickness. You can't demonstrate cap thickness or measure it with IVUS or, uh, or virtual histology. Here you see a ruptured plaque, and here you see uh, the beginning of intraluminal thrombus. So it's going to be very important uh, in these uh, particular areas. So optical coherence tomography, vessel size determination, stent apposition, edge tears, etc., and also for vulnerable plaque detection, as I showed uh, yesterday. Now, what about performing high-risk patients? This is not uh, ST elevation MI. This is a uh, uh, non-ST elevation MI, but very high risk in 2011. How do we approach these patients in the cath lab? <clears throat> these are patients with severely compromised LV function, may have mitral regurgitation, complex coronary anatomy with a large risk area or the only remaining vessel, and we need to talk about considerations for hemodynamic support, intraortic balloon per pump versus the impella, which has been mentioned by uh, previous speakers. Here is uh, a great support device for high-risk PCI. This is a pigtail catheter, uh, and there's a motor drive so that blood is sucked out of the left ventricle and pumped into the aorta. It can increase the cardiac output up to 2.5 liters per minute. Uh, they call this the Impella 2.5. In fact, the cardiac output th can increase up to 2.5 liters per minute, but often the real value is more like one to one and a half liters per minute. The disadvantage is it requires a 13 French sheath, and you need to be aware of the patient's peripheral vascular disease because that's what these patients have. Uh, compared to the intra compared to the intraortic balloon pump, uh, here's the uh, Impella device. Uh, there's going to be a uh, Technician coming out shortly squirts a little bit of dye, and you can see it gets sucked out of this chamber and pumped into this, uh, uh, what they think is the aorta. Okay, here's a case where we think about using one of these devices. 76-year-old woman, end-stage renal disease, hypertension, TIAs, had cabbage six weeks ago with a lima to the LAD, but she has recurrent VT and congestive heart failure, and develops non-ST elevation MI with dynamic ST changes and markedly elevated troponins. And just to make the case interesting, GI bleed with a hemoglobin of 6.7. We transfused her, tried to stabilize her, and we brought her to the cath lab where she had severe calcified uh, left main stenosis, multiple severe calcified lesions in the LAD, a chronic total occlusion of the circumflex in the right coronary artery, severe pulmonary hypertension, the ventricular gram 45%, 3 plus MR, abdominal angiogram, severe bilateral aortoiliac disease. Here's the coronary angiogram. I think you'll agree this is not an ideal candidate for any procedure. We ran her by the surgeons. Uh, they ran away. You can see the vessel is extremely calcified, diffusely diseased, left anterior descending coronary artery with a really super high grade left main and diffuse disease throughout the left anterior descending. Just to make it more interesting, here's the right coronary artery, which is uh, completely occluded. Here's the ventricular gram, which is very important in these patients, EF 45%, and the uh, three plus uh, mitral regurgitation. That's the good news. Now, here is the lima which is completely occluded. And here is the abdominal angiogram. How are we going to deal with uh, this patient with uh, severe hemodynamic compromise, poor LV dysfunction, mitral regurgitation, reduced cardiac output, left main and triple vessel coronary artery disease, and severe peripheral vascular disease with multiple hemodynamic significant lesions in the aortoiliac system? Well, the first thing we do in our lab, uh, we believe in global uh, endovascular uh, reconstruction. We just place a uh, 14 by 40 self-expanding stent in the distal aorta, inflate it, then we place kissing stents through the uh, self-expanding stent, and then we take a picture. Now we have a nice aortoiliac system, and now we can work carefully and place our impella. This is the 13 French uh, sheath going easily through those uh, aortoiliac stents.
Here's the impeller in place, and we start with rotational atherectomy of this only remaining vessel with severe left main disease. Following several passes with the rotablator, we place stents in the mid LAD, the proximal LAD, and at the osteum in the left main. And this is uh, what we're left with, with uh, resolution of this uh, patient's uh, symptoms and the ability to discharge her from the hospital three days later, free of uh, angina or uh, heart failure. So uh, this just shows the principle uh, that we need to keep in mind. What is the work of the heart? And this is the classic pressure volume loop. This is the line of contractility. Mitral valve opens here, the left ventricle fills, the aortic valve, uh, then the ejection starts to take place, the aortic valve opens here, blood is ejected, and the ventricular work is proportional to the area in this pressure volume loop. <clears throat> if you use an inotropic agent and increase this line of contractility, you'll see that the cardiac work is going to increase. If you use an intraortic balloon pump, if you unload the heart, again, the area under the blue curve is greater than the area under the red curve. So the balloon pump increases coronary perfusion pressure, but doesn't decrease left ventricular work. On the other hand, the impella, by unloading the left ventricle, decreases left ventricular volume, and the LV work index is reduced by the use of this uh, device. Well, uh, so this just shows you um, unloading of the left ventricle and increasing in cardiac output. End diastolic pressure is effectively decreased, end diastolic volume increased, and here you see uh, cardiac output is increased by about one and a half uh, liters per minute on, on average. Now, how does that work in clinical practice? For high risk, non emergent PCI, 654 uh, patients, unprotected left main or the last patent conduit ejection fraction less than 35% or triple vessel disease. These patients were randomly allocated to PCI with an intraortic balloon pump versus uh, PCI plus the Impella 2.5. And uh, interestingly enough, there was no important difference in major adverse uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, patients in both groups did reasonably well. So which should we use? Either device can provide significant benefit for high-risk patients. If the main goal if the main goal is augmenting cardiac output, use the impella. If the main call, goal is an increase in coronary perfusion pressure, I use the enteroidic balloon pump. Peripheral angiography is an essential step for either device and strongly consider aortoiliac reconstruction to make these procedures safer. The great majority of high, quote, high-risk PCI does not require either device. So this is a very important clinical uh, uh, decision strategy. What about trends in treatment of uh, coronary, multivessel coronary artery disease? If you look at the uh, Duke database way back in the uh, 1980s, it seems almost like 100 years ago, the most important strategies included coronary artery bypass grafting and medical management. You can see coronary bypass grafting in nearly half the patients. But with the advent of bare metal stents and drug eluting stents, there's been a uh, progressive increase in the use of stent technology uh, with less use of uh, medical management and uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. And my surgical colleagues in Philadelphia love to point out studies like this. This is the New York State Registry of Triple Vessel Disease with Involvement of the Proximal LAD. And if you look at cabbage versus stenting, improved survival for coronary artery bypass grafting. So as a result of uh, reports like this in the New England Journal of Medi Medicine, the New York Times had this very nice picture that uh, caused me to get a lot of telephone calls. In the stent era, heart bypasses get a new look. Now why should a coronary bypass be superior to stenting in multivessel disease? One, you can have more complete revascularization. Second, coronary bypass risk increases very little with increasing degree of coronary disease whereas PCI risk is additive and increases arithmetically with each stent, unlike cabbage. And the cabbage survival benefit is greatest with increasing disease of coronary, with increasing degrees of coronary disease. So if you're dealing with complex lesions, if you're using an endoluminal approach, you've got to deal with the complexity of the lesion. The surgeon doesn't really care how calcified or complex or tortuous that vessel is because he can go around it. On the other hand, uh, we have patient preference, and here this patient is being wheeled 
to the cardiac surgery suite and he's putting his feet up here, he wants you to consider a coronary intervention. Well, a very important study uh, recently published in the New England Journal was the Syntax trial where patients, uh, 62 European and 23 US sites, 1,800 patients were randomized to a paclitaxel stent or coronary artery bypass grafting for multi-vessel and left main coronary artery disease. And you can see that triple vessel disease in two-thirds of the patients, left main disease in about a third of these uh, patients. And then a score was developed. What is the syntax score? It's a score of the complexity of coronary disease. So if you have a total occlusion, tortuosity, bifurcation or trifurcation, aortoosteal disease, lesion length, these all add up in the score. And also there's a weighting for where the lesion is located. If it's located in the left main, it has a weight of 5. If it's located in the LAD, 3.5. So we add up the score for each of these lesions. Here's a case that was uh, sent to us with a lesion in the distal left main the LAD and the circumflex coronary artery, the syntax score was 19, and I'll show you the significance of that. Because of the syntax score, we went ahead, stented the circ first, turned our attention to the LAD, and finally the left main coronary artery. Very simple procedure, and now we have a complete revascularization of this patient in the cath lab. Now, if you look at what are the results of syntax for the left main group, if you look at those with a very high score, greater than 33, you can see that for drug-eluting stents, the cumulative event rate of death, CVA, MI, and revascularization is much greater if these patients get treated with drug-eluting stents. The results are far superior with coronary surgery. On the other hand, if you look at syntax scores which are low or intermediate, less than 32 points, there is no difference between these two treatment arms. In fact, death was a little bit lo was, uh, lower, uh, significantly lower in the PCI group, CVA lower in the PCI group, MI a little bit higher, revas repeat revascularization about the same. So we certainly don't want to do multiple bifurcations that are calcified. When the syntax score gets above 30, 33 or above, those are the patients that should be sent to surgery. For low or intermediate syntax score, we offer this as an option to our patients. So uh, this has caused a change in the United States in the guidelines from uh, left main intervention was considered class 3. It's now either a 2A or a 2B. So do we really need another randomized trial of PCI versus cabbage for left main disease? Syntax leaves many questions unanswered. It suggests but doesn't prove that PCI and cabbage for left main disease have similar outcomes. Could the results be further improved with a better drug eluting stent? The paclitaxel is probably the least beneficial and more optimal pharmacology. What's the optimal approach to distal left main bifurcations? And could IVUS and FFR improve our outcomes? And all these questions are going to be uh, answered. It wouldn't be an all-comers trial. We're going to exclude patients who should go to cabbage, that is high syntax scores. We're going to optimize our PCI techniques by pre-specifying when and how to use FFR and, and IVUS. We're going to use the best stent and adjunct of pharmacology available and also, at the same time, optimize cabbage techniques uh, with minimum waiting time, use, utilize panarterial revascularization and uh, pharmacotherapy. We're also going to use a meaningful primary endpoint death, CVA, or myocardial infarction. We think we'll need about 2,500 patients. So we're going to take patients with a syntax score less than 32 uh, with a consensus agreement by the heart team, the interventional cardiologist, and the cardiac surgeon. And patients will be randomly allocated to uh, drug eluting stent, we're going to use an everolimus eluting stent with a very thin stretch versus coronary artery bypass surgery and clinical follow-up will be through five years. The inclusion criteria, uh, el eligibility for both techniques, significant left main disease by a heart team consensus, you need to have angiography greater than 70% stenosis or greater than 50% with a markedly positive non-invasive study or an IVUS luminaria less than 6, which I showed you, or a fractional flow reserve less than 0 0.80. PCI medications, very important. Aspirin, 
uh, ADP agonists, either clopidogrel 600, prasugrel 60, or ticagrelor. Statin medications, mandatory with high dose, atorvastatin. Procedural anticoagulation with bivalrudin as the, as the uh, recommended strategy. Cabbage medications will also be um, uh, optimized. Now, what about the issue uh, that was raised of uh, stent thrombosis? It's still the sword of Damocles hanging over patient's head. It's catastrophic in its presentation with death, myocardial infarction, and 75%. And there's the issue of impracticality of prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy. Here's the limitation of bare metal stents. This diffuse enamel hyperplasia. Restenosis is all enamel hyperplasia. The potential for complications in bare metal is this enamel hyperplastic material, whereas in the drug-eluting stent era, it's more of the thrombosis uh, issue. Here's my uh, first stent thrombosis back in 1989. I placed the stent in the circumflex. Eleven days later, the patient comes in with an acute posterior wall myocardial infarction. And uh, this is what uh, this disease looks like. It's very different than the uh, instant restenosis. And in 1977 in Europe, uh, a meta-analysis suggested a significant increased risk of death NMI over three years due to very late stent thrombosis of drug-eluting stents. And again, I showed you yesterday the reason for this is the incomplete endothelialization at any time point of drug-eluting versus bare metal uh, stents. And this signal, very late, continues beyond one year, and it occurs in about 0.6% per year. Now, the problem of stent thrombosis is an important one. There's a million patients in the United States who receive stents, and very late stent thrombosis can occur at 0.6% per year. That's 6,000 patients per year. And will we always have to choose between bare metal and drug-eluting stents? And you have to ask yourself, is there a more elegant solution that will allow us to obtain a patent coronary artery without the impracticality of prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy? There are a lot of people you don't want to give Plavix to. This lady uh, is not very happy, and she's very stubborn. She won't take it. We have people with uh, GI bleeding who need hip surgery or who have artificial cardiac valves, atrial fibrillation requiring anticoagulation with warfarin and triple therapy in those patients can be a disaster. So can we develop a bioresorbable scaffold where we re revascularize the vessel like a metallic drug-eluting stent, then resorb naturally back into the body. We leave no permanent metallic implant so that there's no stimulus for chronic inflammation, which could potentially reduce the need for long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, and there is such a uh, device that we're going to start testing in clinical trials uh, shortly in the United States with an Everolimus coating and a polylactide matrix which uh, degrades and uh, resorbs. So support is only needed for a short time period. Drug elution takes place over the first several weeks. Then vascular function, which is reduced when you place permanent stents, the vascular function of the coronary artery, as done by uh, testing with acetylcholine, comes back to normal. So support for a short period of time, no, uh, reduction in restenosis by release of the everolimus, and then return of vascular function. This is called vascular restoration therapy. Here is the uh, uh, Krebs cycle going through here with hydrolysis as the polylactide stent backbone. Here you can see from a porcine model, this is a uh, cipher stent down here out to uh, four years, and you can see the struts of the stent. Here, at uh, beyond two years, you can see the stent is completely resorbed in this porcine animal model with maintenance of the lumen. Here are some OCT images. This was uh, lent to me by Dr. Sarais. Immediately afterwards, you see the struts of this uh, resorbable stent, and at two-year follow-up, the stent has been completely resorbed, and the lumen is maintained. This just shows vasomotor function with a treat treatment with acetylcholine, and restoration of the ability of the coronary artery to react to normal physiologic stimuli. <clears throat> what about the stent thrombosis? Uh, acute, subacute, late, and very late, absent in the small preliminary study. No stent thrombosis up to three years, um, and 
all patients stopped before the two-year follow-up. So this is free of dual antiplatelet therapy with no thrombosis with a bioresorbable device. In summary, uh, we've added significant invasive diagnostic modalities to aid in patient selection and help guide treatment, and these will continue to evolve. We possess a wide range of tools which, with which we expand our therapeutic options to high-risk patients. Stent technology will evolve to provide temporary scaffolding with low recurrence rates with a reduced need for prolonged impractical pharmacologic regimens. And I always tell my fellows, by the time you guys are in practice for five years, I think permanent metallic drug looting stents will be a historical and important uh, footnote. And in closing, I'll just say that uh, yesterday is experience, today is opportunity, and finally, tomorrow is imagination. Thank you very much.